Hi, this is Rachel, and this is topic 28 of our supervision curriculum. And today we're going to be talking about supervising others. So as I explained in the previous lesson, at this point in my supervision curriculum, we are moving to topics where I'm going to introduce a topic or a concept, and then the trainees are going to go and do research on their own and report back to the group so that we can practice both the acquiring information and the describing and reporting back to others. So today's topic, supervising others, could cover a million things. I mean, there are uh, lots of things that are going to fall under supervising others. Today is more along the lines of an intro to the concept of supervising others, how our behavior analytic principles line up with that, and starting the research of what are the sort of technical requirements to supervise someone else in our field. So when we talk about a supervisor, it's not just a supervisor uh, necessarily for an RBT or for behavior technicians or for trainees who are gathering their hours. It could be all of those things, but it also could just be the person who is in charge of a program and in charge of managing other individuals. What we want to do is as supervisors, we want to be sure that we are modeling the skills that we want our trainees, our supervisees to also demonstrate so that we, and we want to serve as a mentor to help providers improve their skills. Um, sometimes, there might be providers, uh, supervisors who are very fluent in their ability to apply the principles of behavior analysis to learners um, in a specific uh, population that they have been serving in a clinical manner. But they may not be able to generalize those same skills and principles from behavior analysis to their interactions with their supervisees or with their trainees or within their supervision. It's not automatic that just because you can teach a small child, for example, that you could then train a technician or supervise a future behavior analyst. These are different skill sets. So we have to keep in mind that just because someone is good at one component, that does not mean that they're going to generalize to a different population. Just like we wouldn't say, oh, you've had experience with young children with autism. Here, you're perfectly prepared to work with this adult with schizophrenia. Those may not have some of the same skill sets, even if one person is really good in this area. We wouldn't automatically say that that generalizes. We shouldn't automatically assume that because someone can teach elementary age children, that they could also teach technicians to teach elementary age children. Those are different skill sets. So keep that in mind and realize that if you are going to be in a supervision role, you will also need to develop your supervisory skills. And we'll talk a little bit about what some of those might be. The second component is going to be that the same behavior analytic principles that work with the learners who you have been serving and accruing your hours with also apply to trainees and supervisees and caregivers. The general processes are all the same. The topography of those actions may look a little bit different, but first we're going to do an assessment and decide what behaviors our trainees need to learn or what skills our caregivers need to develop in order to better meet their needs for supporting their learner. So first, we're going to conduct that assessment. Um, in a supervisee, trainee type relationship, it might be a job task list. 
um, we're going to write an operational definition for that behavior or that skill or those tasks that we expect someone to display. And we're going to design a measurement procedure so that we can assess whether or not they are currently displaying those skills or not. <laughs> and if not, then we are going to teach them. We just talked about behavioral skills training in the previous topic, so we would probably use something like behavioral skills training to teach these new skills or these expectations to our trainees and our supervisees. We would use preference assessments to determine what type of reinforcement would be effective with an individual supervisee or trainee. And yes, trainees and supervisees and employees and RBTs and technicians need reinforcement. Just having a job or getting a paycheck might not be the reinforcer that is most powerful for changing their behavior. First of all, it might not be enough. Monetary might not be enough um, for a particular individual. Second, we're motivated and we do things besides just for money. We might want to uh, give that, get, receive, we might want to receive social recognition and acknowledgement from our supervisor, our mentor, our boss, our employer on a job well done. We might want um, tangible things such as money, but maybe other things like donuts in the break room or um, pizza parties occasionally or whatever, right? We might also want escape, breaks, extra breaks, longer breaks, extra time off. Everybody might have different things that are motivating to them in order to change their behavior. So we should be conducting preference assessments with our trainees, with our supervisees, our technicians, our employees, to determine what is most motivating for them if we're asking them to do something in a particular way as part of their supervision or employment. We also want to make sure that we are then reinforcing our trainees, our supervisees for performing those actions that we are asking them to. If I want a technician to run a particularly challenging program, I need to provide some reinforcement for them running that program besides just you get to keep your job because that's not necessarily a motivator at all. So we do need to reinforce our individuals um, who whose behavior we are changing, whether that is our learners or our staff and our trainees. Um, positive reinforcement is going to produce better responding than negative reinforcement. So well, do it so you don't get in trouble or punishment. Um, if you do it wrong, I'm gonna blah, 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 right? Like those don't work as well. They don't produce the same responses as using positive reinforcement. The principles of behavior analysis apply across organisms. You're going to have to differentiate it. You're not going to be saying, good job, and handing somebody a Skittle for doing their uh, job, but you might need to spend some time with them to um, engage with them in an enjoyable manner for some of that social praise and attention. You might need to bring in some additional things like pizza parties or donuts or whatever it is to help continue to reinforce the behaviors of your individuals, uh, your staff, your trainees. So Basically, the, the second big takeaway here is that the same principles that we use with our learners, we are going to use with our trainees. As a supervisor, you don't throw out all of the principles of behavior analysis and fall back to, well, just do it because I said so when you're a supervisor, because that doesn't work. So for the assignment, um, I would have the supervisees, the trainees, read the BACB website and any relevant newsletters um, to then be able to answer the next 
five uh, or next four questions. Outline the frequency of contact for individuals that are pursuing BCABA or BCBA certification if you're the supervisor. Outline the frequency of contact for maintaining the RBT and the BCABA credentials because those require ongoing supervision. Outline the requirements the supervisor must meet before they can supervise, and some have just changed um, starting in January of 2022. Outline the requirements the supervisee must meet before they can begin their supervision. So what does that trainee need to already have in place before they can start collecting their supervision hours? Assignment number six, identify three tasks of a supervisor uh, within quality supervision. So what are three things that a supervisor is going to do if they are offering quality supervision? Now you can find this through a variety of resources like we've listed here below, um, or the BACB has a supervisor supervision handbook that you can also look through that starts outlining some of those expectations. But the idea is to have trainees start to focus on what are the actual skills, what are the actual tasks that I would need to engage in to be a quality supervisor offering quality supervision. It doesn't just magically happen. These are skills that we would need to learn and practice. So identify three of them. Number seven, create a measurement tool for observing the interactions of supervisees with clients. Now, this would be something where if you are going to go in and provide feedback on how someone else is doing their job, you have to first create a job list. You have to first create a checklist of what it is you're looking for so that you can take data on it so that then you could provide feedback for what you found. And we will have a future topic that covers feedback itself in more detail. But for right now, work on creating that measurement tool. So this might be the checklist for what a provider should do when they are teaching a particular program. It might be a checklist for how they're setting up the environment before they start teaching or how they're wrapping up the end of their session. Um, pick your what you want to focus on, um, what interaction for your trainee with your clients and create a tool where you could go in and mark yes or no or, or something similar, yes or no, are they engaging in these expected behaviors while they are engaged with their client. And then number eight, this is again where I have trainees come and present back to the group. Um, present to the group the requirements for a specific supervision type. If we have group supervision, I divide it up. You do BCBA trainees, you do BCABA, you do RBTs, you do ongoing BCABA, you do ongoing RBT, right? Those are the five. Um, duplicate if you need to, depending upon the size of your group. But present back about that specific one. Tell me, what is the current requirements for supervision? How many contacts do they need? How much is unrestricted versus restricted? How many client observations? Now, one of the reasons why I really focus on this is because we sometimes Remember what we did? Oh, well, when I was getting supervision, I only needed blah, 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 blah. The requirements have changed. We need to stay up to date on those and we need to know where we can go and find that information. Especially right now, since Task List 5 started and um, uh, everything since uh, January 1st, 2022, um, anybody that is previously certified before January will not be supervising people who are accruing hours under the same way they accrued hours. Anybody who did task list four prior to 2022, anybody you're supervising is accruing under a different system than you did. So you need to be aware of that. People that are accruing now, you know, if it stays this way for a while, then maybe you might supervise somebody that's under the same uh, expectations, but it's possible that those expectations will change before you even supervise your first trainee. So 
I have them go and look it up. I have them then present back to the group on all the details of supervision requirements for that particular one. And in that presentation, uh, they are speaking vocally and they are bringing a visual. And if possible, they might include any other components of BST that they can. For example, they might have some questions, which would be our practice opportunity. And then they can give feedback on how we're answering the questions. Um, so that's the assignment. Um, if you enjoy these and want to get notified when there are more topics, uh, please subscribe down below. And then if you have questions or want to provide some of the answers to the uh, assignments in the comments, please do. And I'm happy to answer questions or provide feedback. Thank you so much.